Good morning, and welcome to worship at Zion Lutheran Church in Camas. As I was coming in to work this morning, the Portland area was totally fogged in, but you had sunlight, which was fun to see, and the mountain was glorious. A um, couple things that we just want you to know is that um, during these times, with intense uh, uh, in, uh, infection rates and things like that, we are doing worship only uh, virtually, but we know that you are present with us and that it is together that we get to celebrate our life together, our ministry together, for that is what Christ has called us to do. A couple of th announcements coming up. Uh, we have confirmation today at 11.15 on Zoom. You should have received that link. Uh, no quilters on Monday. Um, also Wednesday, I'm going to start a, a Bible study on the uh, prophet Isaiah. And we're going to cover um, not every single piece of it. That would only take about uh, 26 weeks. But we're going to really focus in on Isaiah and how Isaiah is both a prophet of hope, but also a prophet of challenge. And so join us for that. Uh, Pat will be sending out the uh, links, and you will be able to connect automatically. Uh, men's breakfast on Thursday is happening on Zoom, 7.30. Uh, next Sunday, uh, the confirmation class on Zoom uh, uh, is at 11.15, unless we announce and let you know in advance. Also, please mark on your calendars the Congregational Financial Meeting, February 6th, 1 p.m. on Zoom. All active, confirmed members, please, att please attend. And visitors, you are welcome to be present on Zoom just to see how we do business. So please join us for that. So let's take a moment. I shared this last week, and we will do this each time that we cannot be together. Jesus calls us to remember. And he calls us to remember, remember me. But we, at these times, we get to remember each other. Think about those brothers and sisters who sit around you. Think about those brothers and sisters that you might have coffee with when that's available. Think about those uh, around you who are not members of the church, who are in your neighborhood and community. Let's just take a moment Lift them up in prayer and celebration. For those here in the sanctuary, please stand if you are able and others may just uh, remain seated. Our prayer of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those who called us to welcome. Accept our repentance for the things that we have done and the things that we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, lead us, that we may bathe in the glory of your Son, born among us, and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. Rejoice in this good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ, inheritors of eternal life, live as freed and forgiven children of God. Amen. 
and let us sing together our hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We pray the prayer of the day. Blessed Lord God, you have caused the Holy Scriptures to be written for the nourishment of your people. Grant that we may hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that comforted by your promises, we may embrace and forever hold fast to the hope of eternal life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated as we hear the word of God. This lesson today is taken from the book of Nehemiah. All the people of Israel gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. 
Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Word of God, word of life. Be to God. Responsive reading, Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims its maker's handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of heaven and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The more to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far, far than honey, than honey and the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Second Bible reading is from 1 Corinthians. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with great honor. 
and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our most respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret, but strive for the greater gifts? Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. All the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. I hope you all enjoyed the holiday that we had this past week in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. I hope you gave a thought to some of his teachings and his work. My message today is called The Two Martins. And for our confirmation class later today, there may or may not be a short quiz. Well, The Two Martins were born nearly 450 years apart on opposite sides of the world. Martin Luther was born in Germany. Martin Luther King was born in Georgia in the United States during the Great Depression and at very racially segregated times. Martin Luther King's name was originally Michael King. But when his father, also a pastor, made a trip to the Holy Land and attended a conference in Germany, he changed both their names to Martin Luther King Sr. and Martin Luther King Jr. He was inspired by the life and work of Martin Luther way back when. This was the first connection between our two famous Martins. Both Martin Luther and Mo Martin Luther King Jr went to university, both gained doctorates in theology. Martin Luther King, when he was imprisoned in Birmingham for his freedom work, he quoted Luther's famous statement, here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. They both had huge wrongs in their times that sparked lifelong battles for reform or change. For Martin Luther, it was the people having to buy indulgences or buy their way to heaven. For Martin Luther King, 
It was a black woman being arrested for not giving up her seat on a bus to a white man. Both Martins saw the people struggling with bad laws and bad corruption in their times, and they spent the rest of their lives fighting for truth, equality, and justice in the eyes of God and their fellow man. They both grew up with a deep love and faith in God and were both pastors of their churches. But they also both lived controversial lives. Like all of us, they were not perfect. They were sinners and they made mistakes. But we remember Martin Luther and celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day today because of the work they did to leave the world a better place. They both left a lot of their thoughts and beliefs in written and spoken word. Their writings and speechless speeches are timeless and still very powerful today. Please pray with me. Dear God, thank you for our two Martins and their work, work to make the world a better place. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's just take a moment and know that God's power and presence are with us, that God's word is here to open our hearts and our minds to the glory, power, and justice of God. Mercy, grace, and peace from the one who creates, redeems, and sustains. Amen. Our gospel text for today is actually one of the most significant passages in the entire Gospel of Luke. It will actually define Jesus' ministry on earth in some really powerful ways. And on top of all that, the passage that we have from Nehemiah and Corinthians are also just as powerful. Nehemiah is uh, the governor who has come back into Jerusalem to help rebuild the city and keep it safe. And in that process, Nehemiah empowers the people and challenges the people that they need to understand that it's their responsibility, not someone else's responsibility, to keep the people safe. So here we have in our text, Ezra standing up, a priest at the, and reads the law of Moses to the people. And all of a sudden, the community has shifted that the word of God is now available to everyone. In Paul's writing to the Corinthians, which is also wonderfully powerful, Paul makes the point that he tries to make in almost all of his writings one way or another. And that point that is made for Paul, it, it's critical for what the, he understands to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's set a little context for our lesson from the gospel today. Jesus has been baptized by John the Baptist. And after he's been baptized, he then goes and he's praying, and all of a sudden, the heavens open up, his mind is opened up, his heart is opened up, and all of a sudden, he hears these words, you are my son, the beloved, in you I am well pleased. Well, let's also understand, Jesus hasn't done anything yet. He hasn't done a miracle, he hasn't preached a sermon, he's done nothing. And what God proclaims about him is I am already pleased with you before you've even started your ministry. But then it go goes deeper. Because at that point, Jesus is trying to figure out what this means. What does it mean to be called son or beloved or being well pleased by God? And he goes into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. And what happens in the desert, in addition to being hungry and thirsty, what happens in the desert 
is Jesus comes to understand what his ministry is not going to be about. He understands that it's not about satisfying himself. It's not about Jesus taking care of Jesus. He, he rejects that temptation. He rejects the temptation of worldly power. He rejects the temptation that what this is all going to be about is one big show and impressing everybody. He rejects all of those temptations of what his ministry might be. But in that process, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, this is important, he's filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. He knows what he's not supposed to do. But then what he does is he goes into, back, literally back home, back to Galilee where, where he grew up. And eventually, all the people begin to hear about Jesus. And what's interesting in Luke, he doesn't tell us what people are talking about, just that they are well-pleased as well. So Jesus comes, and all of a sudden, the rumors and the reputation of Jesus begins to spread. He goes home to Nazareth, where he grew up. And what he does, and he obviously has read in the, their synagogue before, because he's invited up to do the reading and to do the reflection on that text. And in Jewish tradition, what they would do is they don't, didn't have a Bible, they didn't have a book. What they had were these huge scrolls that were written on, actually are written on sheepskin, and that they would bring the whole reading set it on the, the table, and then it would be rolled up, and it would be marked where he should be reading from. Jesus takes those marks off and finds another passage in Isaiah. He's breaking the rules. He finds that passage and says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings to proclaim good news to the poor, to release the captives, to recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he sits down and says, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. So, Having rejected, and this is a part of this, why this is important, Jesus has rejected worldly power as the basis of his ministry. He's rejected a ministry based on miracles to be a sh showy in this case. And then Jesus proclaims a kingdom that will take care of the weak and the poor, released to those who are in debt or somehow or another captives by the hardness and harshness of life. He comes in and proclaims that this is about healing of the people and healing of the body. And what he does is when you take someone who has been excluded, Jesus is, this is also a ministry of restoring people into the relationships of the community. This is a ministry that frees everyone from whatever oppresses them. This will be a new era, a new time, a new kingdom, God's time of healing, freeing, caring, restoring, and peace, especially for those who don't have it. And in this text, Jesus is telling the world and his hometown that things will be different. And as we will hear next week, that things not only are going to be different, but some of us are not going to like what he says. This is, the pro this is not a promise for the future. This is a promise for right now, for them to be hearing in their own time, in their own space. 
And this becomes that defining moment for Jesus and for everything that Jesus is going to do from here on out is going to be part of this proclamation that he, that he knows from Isaiah. Healing, feeding people, raising the dead, challenging the status quo, getting authorities angry at him a lot, and welcoming the outcast and the lost and the least and the last. Those who need to experience this new kingdom the most. And here's where we can jump to Nehemiah. And, and here in Nehemiah's text, this earlier echo of this message that Jesus will proclaim in his time, 300 years later, as the priest Ezra stands up, the, the city has been um, just kind of decimated because they rebuilt the temple, but they never fixed the gates. And raiders would be coming in all, the, all seven of the Jerusalem gates, and they would raid and steal from the people and the temple. And Nehemiah comes in, he's proclaimed the governor, and what he does is he organizes the people to protect each other. But he does it in a way that he says, oh, you who live in this neighborhood, the, that gate is your responsibility. And you live, who live over here, this is now your responsibility. And when that work is all completed, and they, there's a, a wonderful stories in there about this, but when the work is completed, he then invites Ezra the priest to come forward and to proclaim the law of God, the law of God, is now going to be the basis of what the Jewish faith is going to be about. It's going to be that the word, that word of God, which is present in the Hebrew Bible, is going to be laid out and going to be read as part of who we are and what we are to do. And what's interesting is in this little passage from Nehemiah, it says this phrase, for all people. For all people. He says it ten times in this one passage. Guess what? It might be the point of the passage. This isn't about the priests and the scribes and the Levites and the rulers of the nation. It's for all people. Because then that brings us to Paul's writing in Corinthians. Corinth, Corinth just a little piece on Corinth. Corinth was really one of the worst examples you can possibly imagine. Corinth w got in trouble every time somebody had to write to them. It's the re they have conflict within conflict within conflict within the community. They can't agree even on how to do potlucks together. Okay? They couldn't possibly be Lutherans, could they? You know, we know how to do that. But what I want us to understand is what Paul's point is here is that Paul's trying to reunite this community and he's being very clear about how that happens. We are one body, many members. We are, we have one spirit that has gifted every person in this community. And don't think that you can say to another member that your gift is not as important as my gift. I'm an eye, you're an ear, who cares about ears? And what he does is he says, and those who are the lowliest members within the community need to be treated with a higher level of respect because that's who they are and that's what they need to do and be. So what Paul does is he starts saying, because and these, he starts saying there are no distinctions. No distinctions. Not Jew or Gentile. And guess what? The Jews and Gentiles in this Christian community have been fighting since the very beginning. There are no distinctions between slave or free. Um, in Roman society, there was a huge distinction between slave or free. What Paul does is he takes all of these things, woman, man, all of these images that might divide us in terms of who's important, who's not. And Paul says, it's one body, many members, 
same spirit, get over it. So we have to ask ourselves, as we hear this, these texts, do we believe this proclamation of Jesus? Can we believe that all people are God's people? That every person has access to the word of God as found in creation and fully in the person of Jesus Christ in the hospitality of the church? Or is this pro promise that Jesus makes, that Paul proclaims, that Nehemiah foretells, is this promise only for a few? Or one kind of believer? Only for people who are holy and righteous in our judgment. Only for believers like you and me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus proclaimed, to bring good news. Good news to the poor and the sick, to prisoners and outcasts, to sinners and saints, insiders and the marginalized, women, men, cis and gay, citizens and immigrants. What other distinctions do you want to add to this? What are the ones that in your own heart or mind shake you up and say, I'm not sure about them? This text, these texts should make you uncomfortable because they certainly do me because they challenge me at the very core of my relationship with God to say, can I believe that it's for all people? Because here's something about scripture that I think we have to understand. Scripture is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfort. And if you're uncomfortable this week, just wait till next. Amen. And we sing.
confess together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again and ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We lift up the prayers of the people. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance so that we are bold to pray. You reveal yourself to us in the word, spoken in creation, reading of scripture, and most fully in the person of Jesus Christ. Fulfill your word through the faithful witness of your church. Send us out to bring your liberating good news to all people, God of grace. Hear our prayer. All creation proclaims your handiwork. Teach us to love the intricate and beautiful bodies that you have created. Bless tiny insects, enormous whales, and every creature in between. Sustain species at risk of extinction and give us the courage to act. God in mercy, hear our prayer. You desire that there be no dissension among us. Where we are divided in our society, nation, or world, come quickly to reunite us into one body. Ease conflict, dispel violence, and bring an end to war. We pray especially at this time for the people of Ukraine and for those on both sides of the border as they speak and act on war. God of grace, hear our prayer. Anoint with your spirit all your people. Grant provisions and justice for people living in poverty, people living with disability, those living with pain, those struggling with COVID, and those living under oppression. God of grace, hear our prayer. Build up the body of Christ in this place. Bless the variety of ministries in this congregation, especially the call committee, church council, and the COVID task force. Empower us to freely welcome and deeply value each person who enters into worship and ministry among us. God of grace, hear our prayer. For what do people, what do the people of God pray for this day? For my grandson and daughter-in-law who have contracted COVID this past week. For my sister Margaret who is anticipating surgery over the next few days. In thanksgiving, we lift before you the saints for whom the promise of salvation has now been fulfilled. Tend to those who mourn, especially the family of Kathleen Kraft. Bring us together in your everlasting glory. God of grace, hear our prayer. Since we have such great hope in your promise, O God, we lift these and all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the risen Christ be with you always. Please encourage you the peace for each other and to those around you and be a person of peace this week. 
Let us hear our special music. You may be seated. Blessed are you, O God, sovereign of the universe. You offer us new beginnings and guide us on our journey. Lead us to your table. Nourish us with this heavenly food. Prepare us to carry your love to the hungry world. In the name of Christ, our light. Amen. You are indeed holy, almighty and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son, that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Having come into the world, he fulfilled your, for us your holy will and accomplished our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks. He gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and his promise to come again. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, not as we are able, or as we are able. And we implore you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants. And these, your own gifts of bread and wine, that we and all who share in the body and blood of your Son may be filled with heavenly peace and joy, and receiving the forgiveness of sins may be sanctified in soul and body, and have our portion with all your saints. All glory and honor are yours, O God, Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. As we pray in the words that our Savior has given us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the one who comes proclaiming. This is the one who gives us life. For here is Christ our Lord in bread and wine. And for those online, the body of Christ given for you. the blood of Christ shed for you. Let's just take a moment. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace now and forever. Amen. We give you thanks, gracious God, and together we say, for we have feasted on the abundance of your house. Send us to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all, strengthened by it the richness of your grace in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And receive God's blessing. God bless you and protect you. God smile on you and be gracious to you. God show you his favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. And we have our sending hymn. Thanks be to God. <laughs>